What causes a recession or depression? Well, first we have a government and its central bank. For various political reasons, these decide to stimulate the economy, and they do this in two ways. First, they set interest rates. Interest rates are simple to understand. Here we have a triangle. The bottom line is time, and the rising line is the return. So imagine if I ran a business and I said to you, hey, give me £100 now, and I'll give you £101 back this time next year. So that would be a year's rate at £1 return. And then I said, or loan me that £100 for five years, and I'll give you £8 back instead. So that would be a five-year rate at £8. Now, the reason for this is because if you lend me money for longer, I have more chance of investing that money into my business and making a higher rate of return. This higher rate of return is then passed on to you as a thank you. So it's in your incentive to lend for longer. However, you may not want to lend for that length of time, maybe because you want to spend your money now or in one year's time, or you may prefer to save for the long term and go for five years or even longer, wanting a higher rate of return. This is what a personal interest rate is. But as you can see, if rates are lowered by the state, if they are set to have a lower rate of return, say 75p for one year, a 25% drop, and £4 for five years, a 50% drop, then you have less incentive to lend for a longer period of time. This encourages you to either put your money in short-term investments, or because the rate of return is so low, you think it's no longer worth investing in at all. So you decline to invest and spend your money buying new consumer goods. Either way, lowering the rate of interest gives individuals more incentive to spend their money now, which the government wants because this, they think, boosts the economy. So the state bank reduces the interest rate, and sure enough, consumers go out and spend money. The shops then see that there's increased demand, which they then think, great, let's go buy some more consumer goods to sell, and the consumer goods industries are really happy, so they increase production of consumer goods to sell to the shops. Of course, they need resources from heavy production industries like steel, oil, agriculture and mining, and so this tells them that there's demand, signalling that they also need to boost production. But in order to boost production, the production or capital goods industries need more capital or currency to expand their factories and so on. And where does this capital come from to increase production? Well, normally it would come from savings and investments, but the interest rate has been lowered, so there's less of that going around. So entrepreneurs and investors go to the banks for money. This is where the government central bank comes in. In order to boost the economy even further, the central bank prints currency into existence. Literally, they create currency from nothing. This process of printing currency has been known by various names such as quantitative easing, QE, or dollar intervention, or counterfeiting. Either way, printing money creates what we call inflation. However, the government now starts printing currency. So let's say that they print some currency, and in doing so, they double the currency supply. What has this done to your share of the currency? Well, you still have your two pieces of currency, but instead of being able to buy half of the food as you could before, now you can only buy a quarter. The government now has six currencies, so can buy six shares of the food. Yeah, by printing currency, they now buy three quarters of the food instead of the half as they did before. 
and you went from having half of the food to having a quarter, even though the number of currency you have stayed the same. You haven't lost any currency, your bank balance stays the same, but you can't buy as much with it. Your purchasing power has decreased even though you have the same amount of currency. Effectively, inflation is an invisible tax that everyone suffers from. It's taking purchasing power away from you and redistributing it to the public sector state. And a lot of people are completely unaware that this is happening, because it isn't obvious that it's happening. No currency is being deducted from your bank balance. If you have a thousand dollars in the bank with the official inflation rate at 2%, which it supposedly is right now, although that's clearly way too low, this means you will lose $20 in purchasing power by this point next year. The numbers on your bank statement will stay the same. It will still say you have $1,000, but you'll not be able to purchase as much with it as you could this year because the prices of things in the shops will have increased due to the inflation. And yes, inflation is created in one place and one place only, the printing press. Counterfeiting currency is the only way to create inflation like this. And the main reason people are seeing prices going up in the shops is because the central bank of your country is printing currency and causing those prices to go up. Worse, it's stealing purchasing power from you and giving that power to itself. It can buy more things at your expense by printing more currency. Also, this is hitting both your savings and your income. If you get a 1% pay rise this year, congratulations, you've suffered a 1% loss in purchasing power because of the 2% inflation of the currency supply. And businesses will suffer too. If a business has a million pounds in the bank, they'll have lost £20,000 of purchasing power by this point next year. That's a lot of currency that's been taken from them and redistributed to the central state, and this causes businesses to suffer losses and cut back in order to survive. And this, in turn, also leads to job losses. So the central states and the central banks print currency. This new currency gets given to the smaller banks who churn it out as loans. Investors and entrepreneurs need capital, so they take out these loans and invest it where it appears that the money is needed. The capital goods industries. Money is thrown at the stock market with industries like the steel industry or the farming industry or the housing industry boosted by cheap credit and easy money. Now, if time stopped here, everything would be great. Lower interest rates caused a spike in consumer spending, which is now being met by the capital goods industries. Unfortunately, time does not stand still. The consumer has either spent all of their savings or is down paying interest on the debts they got into yesterday during the spending spree, or is still trying to invest despite the low interest rates. Either way, they're not spending today like they were yesterday. This then causes demand to fall in the consumer sector, which then signals to the capital goods industries that demand has fallen. So the capital goods industries are now in trouble. They've overexpanded themselves to meet a demand which was only there temporarily. But they have the added cost of having expanded their business, and now they have debts to pay off. Worse, they can't afford to pay them off because nobody's buying their goods, because the demand that was artificially created in the first place it doesn't exist, right? Basically, they're in a mess. They're in a bubble. And... The bubble looks like it's about to pop as they're struggling to pay off their debts. Now, there's two options here. The devil's at the crossroads. The state can either let the bubble pop, let the recession happen, or keep printing currency and lowering interest rates to keep the boom in the capital goods industries going. If they let it pop, the capital goods industries will have to cut back or go out of business, resulting in unemployment and social unrest, and we have a recession. 
this looks bad for the government, so normally they choose to keep inflating the currency supply and lowering interest rates. Lowering rates will, once again, give the consumer more breathing room. They'll have less to pay on their credit cards and mortgages, will be able to borrow more currency, and be able to spend above their means again. Any savings that survive the first batch of inflation and lowered interest rates will now have even less reason to be saved. All this encouragement to spend will stimulate an artificial spending spree. And once again, this boosts demand, which then signals to entrepreneurs and investors that they should, once again, invest in capital goods industries. Printing currency allows them to pump extra cash into the industries, keeping them propped up in an ever-inflating debt bubble. And the same thing happens over and over. The consumer stops spending, the capital goods industries get into trouble, the state and the banks bail them out, but over time, the consumer gradually loses their purchasing power through all the debt accumulation and the fact that the capital goods industries are making things that they either don't want or are too expensive to buy, such as housing. This is why, during the boom years, the consumer sees their living standards gradually coming down, through no fault of their own, even if they lived frugally. Their purchasing power is gradually robbed from them, and it ends up in the hands of the state and the central banks. Yes, the boom years are bad for the consumer, the average guy on the street. And this keeps going, and going, until it doesn't. Either the government fails to print enough currency for some reason, or they get into a point where they can't lower interest rates anymore. Hypothetically, you shouldn't be able to lower interest rates below 0%. Otherwise, they'll be paying people cash to lend cash off them, which makes no sense. And they'll be charging you to keep your cash in the bank, which you won't do, so you take it out of the bank. Um, and of course, if the consumer takes their cash out of the bank, that would lead to a bank run and an inflation crisis, as more and more currency comes out of the system. So, in theory, they shouldn't be able to go below zero. But speak to Sweden, Denmark, Switzerland and Japan, they have managed to go below zero. This is why governments are trying to get rid of physical currency and go fully digital, so they can prevent you from withdrawing your currency from the banks. This would, in theory, stop a bank run from happening. If you're unable to get your currency out of the banks, you will have no option but to stay in the system as they drive interest rates into negative territory. This will allow them to steal more currency from you, either through inflation or through direct charges to your bank account, and continue to inflate the bubble. Of course, it comes to the point where the printing of currency is starting to be counterproductive. Prices are going up in the shops, bills aren't getting paid, there's less spending power each month, living standards are being squeezed, there's less jobs, it's becoming harder and harder to save. Eventually, the consumer realises that the quality of the currency is being reduced as time goes on. So, the smart ones will switch to non-currency assets like gold and silver, or other physical goods, in order to protect their savings. Those who are unable to see what's happening will be the most unfortunate. As the printing of currency continues, the economy begins to implode. The last to know will realise too late that prices are increasing constantly in the shops. Knowing that their currency will be able to purchase less in the future, they'll rush out, withdraw their currency from the banks, and or spend all their savings before the currency becomes worthless. At that point, the crisis is now obvious. You're entering into hyperinflation territory, which is really bad. Confidence is lost in the system, you have a bank run, and then the whole thing comes apart. Depending on how the government reacts, 
they could either stop the printing of currency and ignite the recession, or they could continue to keep printing. Um, hyperinflation will basically kill the economy. Prices will rise higher and higher. It will cost a wheelbarrow worth of currency just to purchase a loaf of bread. People will start using currency as wallpaper or, you know, for their walls, or will turn it into kites, or will stop using it altogether. As the economy abandons the currency, it reverts back to barter. If you have gold and silver at this point, you're going to be in a pretty good position, since small metal coins, easily divisible and handy to carry around, don't have a short shelf life, unlike eggs, which are often used to barter. In Weimar, Germany, since the government had already taken their gold off them, people used eggs, furniture or bedding as currency. Of course, none of that is really viable. If you don't want furniture or bedding, you're stuck with it, and it's hard to store. Eggs only last a few days before they become worthless. Plus, they're easily breakable uh, and easier for criminals to spot and then steal. But the fact that people were resorting to using eggs as a means of exchange indicates that the economy has been killed by the hyperinflation of the currency supply. And the government knows that this will be the eventual outcome of their inflation policy. So, when the next financial crisis hits, just like every time beforehand, they're presented with a choice. They can either choose to hyperinflate, destroying the economy, or they can decide to stop or slow down their printing of currency and or raise interest rates. If they choose to stop printing currency and raise rates, the flow of currency going into the capital goods industries stops. The debt bubble that they're in is now unpayable and it pops. Factories, mines, farms, corporations, real estate agents are all in trouble. In order to raise the capital to pay off their debts, they need to sell off their goods quickly. But because they've been producing goods that nobody really wants, or can't afford because the price is artificially too high due to the cheap credit and regulations, they can't sell. Not only have they overexpanded, but they have few buyers. Suddenly, economic reality hits home. Their goods aren't worth the price tag. They've significantly overproduced certain capital goods which nobody wants or can afford. And so, when there's no demand and plenty of supply, prices must be lowered to entice people to buy. Well, now this basic law of economics comes into force, and it really comes into force. Prices are cut, nobody buys. Prices are cut again, nobody buys. Prices are cut again and again and again and again. Prices start falling rapidly. Cheap goods flood the market. House prices fall. The cost of steel falls. Food prices fall. And the retailers are also forced to cut prices in order to sell products to the consumer, who still isn't buying due to the news that they're in a recession. Everyone's tightening their belts. They're only buying things that they really need, not cars, steel, or furniture, wood, uh, or clothes, textiles, or homes, house prices. So prices in these areas have to come way, way, way down before people can be convinced to purchase something like this. And as prices are falling, people aren't really interested in buying things like houses anyway, so prices plummet even more rapidly. Also, this is why you get the myths that overproduction or underconsumption caused the recession. To the shop owner or the factory owner or the real estate agent, it looks like the economy has overproduced, and it looks like the consumer just isn't buying. The house owner has a house he can't sell, so they must have overproduced houses. And the consumer just doesn't want to consume these houses. But this isn't true. 
right now I want a house, and I can't buy one because the price is many times the actual value of the house. It's not because there's under-consumption. You know, I, I want to consume. I want to buy a house. And there's plenty of houses being built. The problem is that, because of the inflation, you have all the houses being bought up by corporations or whatever, who can't afford to buy them, but who are buying them because they're getting cheap loans from the central banks. So, that prices out the poor people like me, who have no choice but to rent and wait for the next housing market crash. But when the bubble pops, and house prices are falling, people still won't buy. And they'll be saying it's under-consumption. No, no, hold on. No one who's not an idiot is going to buy something that's priced too high. They're going to wait until the price of the house returns to fair value, its actual value. We'll wait until house prices have fallen to their bottom. It's not under-consumption or over-production. The price has been set artificially too high in the first place, and the reason it's too high is because of the inflationary and interest rate policies set by the state. And there is overproduction in the bubble economy, but only in the wrong areas of the economy. They've overproduced steel, which people don't want, and underproduced other consumer goods that people do want. Um, so it's not that there's overproduction as such, but that manufacturers have produced the wrong things. And they produced the wrong things because of the manipulation of the market by the central state, which gave mixed signals to investors, telling them to produce more of the wrong type of things and produce less of the right type of things. By the same token, it's underconsumption in the wrong areas, not underconsumption overall. Everyone didn't just all of a sudden decide to become frugal and live like monks. Um, you know, they still want things, just not what's being offered. Maybe we've produced uh, tons of bread because we subsidized and regulated the farms to overproduce wheat. But in reality, people wanted beef, so they're now not buying as much bread. Um, that's not under consumption, they just want to consume something different than what's being offered. But, again, the cheap credit gave the wrong signals to the producers, who overproduced wheat instead of cattle. The consumer is under-consuming the wheat, but wants to consume more beef. So that's not under-consumption, it's a misallocation of scarce resources, again caused by the central state. So, with the bubble popping, you'll find a lot of people unemployed. And you shouldn't be surprised to learn that most of this unemployment is coming from the capital goods industries and the big corporations and the banks who thrived on easy credit, but who are now going bust. The small businesses, which are doing their best to fulfill the actual needs of the consumer, will be fine for the most part, and some will even be able to expand during this time, helping to soak up uh, the unemployed coming from the overexpanded capital goods industries. But here's something that may surprise a few people to learn. For the consumers who are still employed, these bust years are actually a time of plenty. During the boom years, you tend to see capital goods employees receiving much higher pay rises compared to non-capital goods employees thanks to all that inflation. Now though, the capital goods employees are seeing their wages cut or finding themselves unemployed. Meanwhile, living standards for those in the consumer sector, which were squeezed during the boom, are now rising. Again, economic reality is fixing the manipulations caused by the boom. Wealth that was being stolen from the consumer and retail sectors and redistributed to the public sector and the capital goods industries is now coming back to the consumer as it should do. Yes, wages for the consumer sector will be falling, but prices will be falling even quicker, resulting in higher living standards overall. You'll have less wages, but be able to buy more things 
with those wages. This is why, during a recession or depression, you should be ready to take pay cuts. It sounds counterintuitive, but wage cuts are actually good for you. Because of the falling prices, it's better for you to keep your job than to lose it. And insisting on a higher wage during a recession is a good way to lose your job. If you do keep your job, even with a pay decrease, you should find your living standards increasing. And also, by taking pay cuts, you'll allow businesses to hire more workers, which will ease the unemployment problem. And instead of having shops with a handful of workers running around frantically trying to get the work done, there will be more workers overall, easing the pressure. So not only are your living standards increasing even though wages are falling, but you've helped the unemployed find jobs, and you're probably finding your own workload decreasing. There'll be less job stress, and maybe even more opportunities for you to advance in an expanding consumer sector. Of course, while the consumer and the consumer sector are receiving a long-awaited relief, the capital goods industries are in trouble. They're shutting down or cutting back, and rightly so. Because nobody wanted what they produced, capital goods employees now find themselves unemployed. And this is right. It sounds harsh, but it's right. If people wanted what you produced, then you wouldn't be unemployed. You've not been producing something that anyone wants. And during the boom years, the wages of the capital goods employees were artificially much higher than they should have been compared to the rest of society. They reaped the benefits of all this manipulation. And now, they're unemployed. But we should feel sorry for them, right? No, not really. Obviously, we don't want people to go hungry, but we also don't want them producing something that nobody wants. So instead of encouraging them to sit around and do nothing, let's encourage them to find new work, producing something that people actually want. And yes, they will have to take a lower wage than they did previously, but Again, not only is this good, but their previous wage was way too high anyway. It's harsh, but these people benefited during the boom years and weren't concerned that everyone else was seeing their living standards squeezed by them. Uh, they had a good ride, but now they're being brought back down to everyone else's level. So they can moan about it, but the reality is that this is where they should be. The good news, of course, is that with falling wages and higher consumer consumption during the recession, the unemployed will be able to find jobs in the consumer sector. Usually, a year or so after a recession has begun, you know, everything would return to normal, everyone will be back in jobs. The Great Depression of 1920 to 1921 in America lasted 18 months, but then everything was fine. Assuming the government doesn't try to manipulate the economy again, the economy will also look a lot more balanced. The recovered economy will have a much bigger focus on consumer goods, since most people aren't interested in buying coal, steel or tanks, and want consumer goods and higher living standards. They will get those things in the new economy. But, since the First World War, most governments have decided to fix what they deem to be a broken economy. Yes, they created the problems in the first place, and then they decide to try and fix it. As you can imagine, this goes badly every single time. They try to prevent falling prices using price controls, or prevent falling wages through minimum wages, or continue to print currency, or continue to slash interest rates, or keep them low, or give unemployment benefits, or start job creation schemes to produce things that nobody wants, etc. Everything I've just listed there, and more, will do nothing more than prolong the recession, deepen the recession, and generally make the situation worse. Let's take an example. Wages are subject to the law of supply and demand. 
if I'm paying one employee £100 and I want to employ someone else who's unemployed, but I don't have any extra money to spare, then the only way that I can recruit that other employed unemployed person is to pay the current employee £50. This will spare £50 for me to give to the other new employee. So if you've got a lot of unemployed workers, then wages need to come down because you have too much supply of workers. Lower wages will allow businesses to recruit more people. Or those with savings can set up their own businesses, freeing up their previous jobs, etc. If you prevent wages from coming down, none of this can happen. Thus, when the government insists on wage controls, either minimum wages or just preventing wages from decreasing during a recession, you find yourself with lots of long-term unemployed. Again, this is why wages need to come down. Governments preventing the fall of wages are actively preventing job creation, and they're doing this to help the workers, which is a lie. They're doing it because they don't understand basic economics. The real minimum wage is zero. If you don't provide value to society, then you will get nothing back from society. Your wage will be nothing. That's the real minimum wage. And if you're currently unemployed, but you're complaining that there's no jobs, try advertising yourself to employers by saying you'll work for one dollar an hour. I guarantee you'll get a job instantly. So it's not like there's no jobs, it's because wages are artificially too high. If minimum wage is £10 an hour, and you offer to work for £8 an hour, you'll be more likely to find a job, obviously. But you then get people saying that this isn't fair, and that people should get a fair wage and a living wage. And yes, you do need enough to live, but the only way that you're going to put food on your plate is to either produce the food yourself or exchange goods and services with other people who produce the food. And if you don't provide any goods or services that people who produce the food value, then they are not going to give you their food. So if you don't like your low wage, then it is down to you to produce more value to society. A fair wage is whatever reward you get for contributing to society. If you contribute little, you will get little. And that's fair. If you contribute a lot, you get a lot. That's also fair. If you work 100 hours a week, but you produce nothing of value, then you'll get nothing. That's fair. Working for the sake of working is pointless. You need to actually produce for the consumer, and the consumer will reward you for your work. You can only receive from society if you give to society. You can only get a wage if you produce for society. You can only get rich by contributing a lot to society, and society will reward you in exchange for your contribution. Contributing little or nothing to society, but then demanding that people give you a higher wage and forcefully using the authorities to steal wealth to re redistribute it to you, despite the fact that you've not actually contributed much to society, is not fair. If you want a fair wage, then it's up to you, it's, it's all on you, to contribute more value to society. Same with unemployment benefits. We want to be encouraging people to get to work in order to produce and contribute to society for the benefit of society. We shouldn't be encouraging them to do nothing. How is it fair that those who do not work are allowed to consume the resources that other workers have made? Like, the workers who are producing value to society will see their living standards decrease as they find themselves producing for people who aren't producing anything in return. How is that fair? It's not fair. If you don't contribute to society, you are not part of it. Now, again, we don't want people to starve, but we also don't want to be giving them free houses and better wages than the employed, which is in a lot of cases, is actually happening uh, in the UK. So, 
Let's not give out copious amounts of unemployment benefits. Let's encourage them to get to work and make something in return for what society is giving them. Bottom line, all these measures that the government takes to try and cure the crisis are actually counterproductive. They deepen the recession. Of course, they sound great at first. You know, look how great we are. We're giving currency to the unemployed. But the reality is that these policies don't work and they make things worse. What the government can do is not create the recession in the first place. They need to not print currency at all. We need a stable money system, not like the partial gold standard in the 1800s, but a fully 100% backed gold standard. This will prevent governments or banks from inflating the currency supply and thus causing the recession. Also, governments need not to artificially adjust interest rates. In, in fact, better that the central government or central banks don't even touch the economy at all. But if they do touch the economy and do get us into recession, they need to stop printing currency. And then they need to let interest rates rise to their natural level and let the economy sort itself out. This is called laissez-faire, leave alone. And this is why the Depression of 1921 in America lasted 18 months, while the Great Depression in 1929 lasted until 1945. Please see Robert Higgs' Depression, War and Cold War for reasons why it lasted until 1945. In 1921, the American government did nothing, laissez-faire. In 1929, the American government did everything. We might have done nothing. That would have been utter ruin. Instead, we met the situation with proposals to private business and to Congress of the most gigantic program of economic defense and counterattack ever evolved in the history of the Republic. We put it into action for the first time in the history of depression. Dividends, profits and the cost of living have been reduced before wages have suffered. They were maintained until the cost of living had decreased and profits had practically vanished. They are now the highest real wages in the world. Creating new jobs and giving to the whole system a new breath of life. Nothing has ever been devised in our history which has done more for the common run of men and women. Some of the reactionary economists urged that we should allow the liquidation to take its course until we had found the bottom. We determined that we would not follow the advice of the bitter end liquidationists and see the whole body of debtors of the United States brought to bankruptcy and the savings of our people brought to destruction. Yes. Hoover intervened massively when the Great Depression hit and tried to prop up wages. He had price controls, wage controls, unemployment benefits, work creation schemes, high taxation, the whole package. The crash happened in 1929, yet in 1932 it was still going. And once Roosevelt got in and did more of the same, it continued right through until Roosevelt's death in 1945. Only once the shackles of government controls came off the economy in 1945 did the economy fully recover from the government's manipulation of the interest rates and currency supply in the 1920s. So, what causes a recession or depression? The government, the central banks, the fractional reserve banking system, and the inflation of the currency supply. Thanks for watching guys. I actually recorded this in December and Terry has edited it uh, months ago. And I was planning to publish it prior to the next recession and uh, well, it's already happened now. I've been keeping up with the new recession that we're now in, so if you guys want me to talk about that, I'm happy to do it. Otherwise, I'll stick to history and tanks. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Bye for now.